I'm Greg Wheatley, and my guest today on Inside Wheaton is Dr. Amy Peeler. Dr. Peeler is Assistant Professor of New Testament at Wheaton College and uh, is the author of a book just out. It actually is her uh, Ph.D. dissertation, You Are My Son, The Family of God in the Epistle to the Hebrews. And actually, uh, one of Amy's great interests is this letter to the Hebrews. We'll spend a lot of our time talking about that today, I think. But first of all, Amy, welcome. It's good to have you here. Thank you. Great to be here. You've been at Wheaton College how long? Just about a year and a half. Uh, one of the newbies. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> tell me a little about your journey here, where you came from educationally, and uh, tell us about how you got here to Wheaton. I went to a Christian liberal arts college, Oklahoma Baptist University. So I have a love for uh, the kind of learning that goes on here at Wheaton. Um, from there, I went right on to seminary because I knew I wanted to study the Bible, and it was either get more degrees or work at Barnes & Noble, so I chose the <laughs> former. I went to Princeton I Seminary. I won't ask you whether that was a good decision or a bad decision. <laughs> right. I'm enjoying it. Good. Uh, I went to Princeton Seminary. I had a great experience there doing a Master's of Divinity and stayed on to do my PhD. I studied under Ross Wagner uh, and had a wonderful advisor relationship with him. Uh, from there, I did a postdoc at Indiana Wesleyan University. I worked in their Honors College, and that was really where I cut my pedagogical teeth hmm. and was very thankful for that experience. But that was a temporary position. And so as that was coming to a close, I heard from my good friend Keith Johnson about an opening here at Wheaton. And I thought, who am I to apply to Wheaton? <laughs> uh, but I gave it a shot, and step by step, God kept opening the doors, hmm. and and here I am. That's great, a great story. I, I want you to tell uh, a little bit about how you came to know you wanted to teach the Bible. Oh, uh, yes. Sort of this aha moment. Uh, Definitely. Talk about that. I started out college as a psychology major. I loved talking to people. I wanted to do counseling. But I took uh, Life of Christ. Everybody needed to take a Bible elective and also Greek my uh, fall of my junior year. And I took Greek simply because they said the professor was great. You should try it. It really was about three days into the semester. And I thought, this is mm. what I want to do with my life. Mm. So I went and talked to my New Testament professor. Can I change my major as a junior? and we got it all worked out. And so by the time I was done, I finished on time. I had had five semesters of Greek and two of Hebrews, uh, two of Hebrew, sorry, I always stutter at that. <laughs> and, um, uh, and I was ready to go on to teach, to teach God's word in the mm. academic setting. What is it about, uh, what do you think captivated you? Mm. I, I mean, so, you know, you were a Christian right. and, and so it wasn't that you didn't know God's word or love it, but why that captivation to, uh, to teach it. Oh, that's an excellent question. Um, I think I saw I had been raised in the church, so I knew how to study God's Word with my heart and to think about it devotionally, yeah. which is so powerful. But I had always been a person that loved school and um, enjoyed academics. And so when I found out that people can spend their lives studying Scripture in that way, I was hooked. Mm -hmm. And especially the beauty of the Greek language, that it's detail and structure, I just loved. And that I was studying Greek just not to be smarter, but because I could better understand tool, God's right? word. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Let me let me ask Amy a little bit about this idea of studying devotionally mm -hmm. versus, ah. and I know it's not an either or, but, but I want you to talk about that because I sure. think a lot of Christians never get beyond mm. the strictly devotional reading right. to understanding what it means to dig into this as literature and then allow that to inform our devotion. How do you, how do you, Put those together. Precisely. I, I think a difference between the two, an academic and a devotional focus, is that in the academic focus, you're asking a different set of questions. Um, I think in the devotional reading, you're primarily saying, God, through your Holy Spirit, speak to me today, which is wonderful. When you come to the Bible in the classroom, you're saying, how has this word spoken throughout history? Mm -hmm. Therefore, I need to know the context be behind it, and I need to listen to the voice of the church after it. And at Wheaton, a particular focus here is I need to listen to the voice of the church around me today. So I would say one chief difference is that's a transition from an individual to more communal reading. But I have found, and I, I thank God for this, that in my work with Scripture, that's only encouraged and deepened my faith. And so you're you're exactly right. Mm -hmm. I don't see those as two different things. Yes, do I need to maintain a habit of my own scripture reading and prayer? Absolutely. But my preparation for class, my work on research will open up new areas of God's character to me through his so, word. So are you, I'm just going to push on this a sure. little bit because this is very interesting to me, exegesis and hermeneutics, right? Right. There's two ways to look at that. When you as a Bible scholar, mm -hmm. sit down to have your, I don't know what you call it, if it's a quiet time. Or, right. Do you, 
is there a difference? Like, do you turn a switch on and off? Do you say, well, now I'm going to read devotionally. Um, I'm not going to worry about the, the, the Greek word. Or, uh, uh, or, or is it just all of one piece for you? I, I see that as more symbiotic, really. They, they work together. Um, but I think being a biblical scholar, you do have to protect yourself against saying, well, I never really need to worry about devotional time. I'll just do that at work. So yeah. there still yeah. is an important part of yeah. for me in a quiet, and I'm very much a morning person, to come and to say, okay, Lord, I want to sit and hear from you. Mm-hmm. And I'm it's sometimes an issue of stance for me. Am I kind of trying to work with the text and get my hands in it? Or those times are more, am I sitting at the feet Mm -hmm. of the Lord to hear from him? So there's sometimes a slight difference, but really it all works together. Sometimes I'll dissever something in my devotions and I'm like, this is exactly what I need to do in class today. Having said that though, and I'm, I'm gonna assume this and you correct me if I'm wrong, you would say that even for the average Christian who who's not a Bible scholar, mm-hmm. um, we need to move beyond this sort of now God just zap me with your word, right. um, sort of overcome me, without saying wait a second I need to first say what was he saying to whoever the audience was, right? right? Isn't that a danger? Uh, Uh, I think that's very true. Um, Sometimes my students will ask me, well, what about children? Or what about my grandmother who's never had education? God can speak through his word. He is not bound. But if we want to read well, if we want to avoid misunderstandings, and if we want to read deeply, then bringing those questions of context and history, that's for everyone. And that's the joy of uh, publishing. I mean, sometimes when I'm sitting in my office writing, I think, well, am I doing any good for anyone? I think, well, if someone is reading this, Mm-hmm. And they can better understand what God is trying to speak to them through history, through narrative, et cetera, mm-hmm. then, then that is a worthy goal. Yeah. Let's talk about Hebrews. Yeah. It's Hebrews now, not right. Hebrew, right? Not the language, yes. Uh, why, your, uh, why your intense interest in the letter to the mm-hmm. Hebrews? You know, I actually think that started as a teenager um, when I was just doing my own reading of Scripture and came upon those warning passages. Mm-hmm. Um, it is those a fearful trip up thing. Every Christian, exactly. Yeah. Um, and so I remember being very afraid have I done this? Have I sinned? willfully so there no longer remains a sacrifice for my sin. So I think that was my first exercise in exegesis, even though I didn't know it. So I did some study. I talked to my pastor. But as I looked at the letter more, I saw, you know, there are some scary points in it, but there's also great assurance. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, he's perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Um, This vision of uh, all of us celebrating on the mountain of God. When I got to doctoral work, um, I loved Paul, but I also loved Hebrews. And so I remember there was a day you had to make a decision. What are you going to do? And Hebrews just seemed like this place where there was a lot of work that needed to be done. Um, I didn't know if I could say anything new about Paul, <laughs> but Hebrews was this kind of burgeoning field, and um, I am still, I still love it. Mm. I've never gone through that. Oh, I've done my dissertation. I'm sick of looking at it. Thankfully, I still am hungry yeah. to get more out of it. So, who wrote it? I think it's Apollos. Um, That's an excellent question. Of course, the church has wrestled with this. You see this in the history of its canonicity. But Apollos seems a good fit. He's a Jew. He's from Alexandria, which means he would have been trained in rhetoric. He knows Paul, but he's not Paul. He's a good orator. All of these things would be true of the author of Hebrews. Of course, there's a a woman who argues that it's Priscilla, of Priscilla and Aquila. Uh, If I get to heaven and find that out, that will be great. You'll be thrilled about that. (laughs) But there's one time the author refers to himself with a masculine masculine. Masculine pronoun, so I, I think. Uh, <laughs> so let me take you to the the title of your book. Yeah. Um, you are my son, the family of God in the Epistle to the Hebrews. What mm-hmm. what's the theme? What, yeah. Where are you getting it? So that is a quotation from Hebrews one five, which is the first scripture in Hebrews. You probably realize this, but Hebrews has more citations and allusions to the Old Testament than does any other mm. book in the New. Maybe save Revelation. There's kind of a competition between them, but a lot of scripture. And what's really different about Hebrews is that every time the scripture is introduced, the Old Testament scripture, the author never says it was written. That's what Paul always Mm, says. It was written. But what does he say? He says, God says, Mm. Jesus says, the Holy Spirit says, and almost always it's God. God speaks scripture. And so I was taking a class on rhetoric, and we were learning about the importance of persuasive speech in the ancient world, and particularly logos, pathos, and ethos, Mm -hmm. the means of um, argumentation. Well, ethos is how you convey your character through your speech. That struck me because we know almost nothing about the author to Hebrews, hence the question we always want to know who wrote it. Um, 
but we who does most of the speaking? It's God. Hmm. And so I thought, you know, I think the author is trying to show us the character of God through what he says in hmm. this word. And the first thing that is said is, you are my son. Yeah. Uh, today I have begotten you. I will be a father to him. He will be a father. He will be a son to me. It is this paternal, fatherly character that is forefronted at the letter. And as I started looking closer, I said, you know, this is really a dominant theme throughout. So more than just uh, the relationship between God and his son, you're, you're seeing all of us as family of God in this? Precisely. So it's it, chapter one is all about their relationship. But chapter two moves to this powerful image that Jesus takes on humanity. And when he does so, we become mm. sons. That he's of, our brother. And right? children. He's exactly. Brother, yeah. And I think that actually, going back to my first interest in Hebrews, that puts the emphasis on the right syllable in the letter. <laughs> it puts the emphasis on the assurance that what God has done by giving Jesus an inheritance that's mm. already secure, we as children are part of that inheritance. Yeah. So should you be um, concerned about the vibrance of your faith? Absolutely. But your trust rests in what God has already done in mm-hmm. Christ. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's well said. And and so then that follows. I think you're working on a book now, right? On on the fatherhood of God. Exactly. It come out of the same same emphases. It I, did. It did. Uh, I noticed in a lot of literature on God as Father, Hebrews doesn't get mentioned. Of course, you have a lot of reflection on that Jesus called God Abba, and that's very important. But I feel like this letter has a lot to say about mm-hmm. who our God is as Father. And I've been particularly interested in the conversation with feminist theology. Some have said to call God Father is to make him into a man or to be patriarchal. Um, and some people don't have a re- good relationship with their dad, so we should avoid this. And I I don't want to go in that direction. I think scripture is very clear that this is not just a picture or an image or a metaphor of God, but who God is in relationship with the Son and therefore to us. Now, he defines what fatherhood means. Mm-hmm. We don't kind of imagine mm-hmm. an earthly dad yeah. and project it. But still, there's something there's something very vital in that language that I want to hold on to in a respectful dialogue with those critiques from feminist theology. Mm-hmm. We don't have a whole lot of time for this, but let me take you back to those, those naughty passages yeah. about falling away. And right. uh, can you give us sort of a brief, mm-hmm. I mean, because I think that has troubled a lot of oh, Christians definitely. over a lot of years. Um, just a little bit of summary of that? Yeah. Right? You know, I think it's very interesting to notice in the letter that the three most intense warnings in chapters 6, 10, and 12, after he issues these, always the author comes back and says, but I'm not talking about you. Yeah. You have been faithful. You've been persecuted. Are they maybe getting a little lazy? Yeah. But he says, this has not happened to well, you Well, they were yet. tempted to go back to uh, legalism, weren't that they? That they were. Yeah. They were. They were yeah. tempted to either uh, avoid the persecution they are facing or maybe um, find their their salvation in the Jewish cult. Um, and he says, but you've not done that yet. So in some ways, he's he's giving this picture of Jesus as highly exalted. There's no other way. Uh, he's the only mediator. And if you walk away from that, and then there's nothing What's left. left yeah. But it is, I want to, I always emphasize with my students, it's a warning. And he's not trying to answer the question, what if I fall away and want to come back? And he's also, the warnings that he issues are intense. It is apostasy. It's not, I gossiped or I forgot my quiet yeah, time one morning. Yeah, so yeah. I always say, especially when I my husband and I served as a youth pastor, we said to our young students, if you're worried about this, you have not committed yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and that's, of course, the church has decided different things on, can you walk away and then come back? But again, that's just not the question that he's asking. He's saying, look at how awesome Christ right, is, and right. there's no other salvation apart from him. Yeah, that's very helpful. I, you know, you find, and, and again, I think, Amy, what we're getting at here is this importance of seeing Scripture in its clarity, not just allowing, I, I don't know how you grew up, I grew up in a, in a it just wasn't explained carefully mm. that you need to look at this, look at what the author is really saying. You sort of lift it out verses. Right, and right. then it's very easy to get in whatever the topic, it's very easy to get off track with that. That's very true. Yeah. Yeah. So just doing the simple act of reading what comes before and after sometimes can be very enlightening. Give us some, uh, give us some practical tips. Somebody's listening and they've, they've never really developed this sense of studying the Bible Uh, on their own. Yeah. Um, How do you get started at that? Great question. You know, I have a series of questions that I use almost every time I come to a new text, either for teaching or maybe a, 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 being preached or taught at church. And it's very simple. It's just paying close attention to the text. Like I just said, what comes before and after? Uh, Another question to ask is, who's the main actor and who's being acted upon? Mm -hmm. Uh, What words are repeated? And if I don't know those words, then there's some great online resources like Blue Letter Bible that can give me a sense of what that word meant in the first century. 
I think exegesis, I always tell my students, it's a fancy word, but it's not a fancy thing. Mm. It's just reading well, carefully, Mm -hmm. and frequently. That's the other thing. The exercise that I do makes me read the text seven or eight times. Mm -hmm. And I usually spread that over the course of a week so that it gets in my heart and my mind and I'm thinking about it. And then I think the Spirit can um, call to mind things that we haven't noticed on a first reading. Reading long stretches rather than little little tiny pieces. That's a great point. And when students take my New Testament class and I say, okay, this weekend you're reading all of Matthew and then next week you're reading all of Luke. (laughs) That's usually something they've not done before Mm -hmm. and they always notice something that they Mm -hmm. haven't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the tradition of the church, Lectio Divina is just a continuous long reading, prayerfully letting Mm -hmm. God speak to you. And you'll start to notice those connections. I always have a pen. I say, don't be afraid to mark in your Bibles. Mm -hmm. Um, Highlight. And of course, there's lots of good methods of study that will encourage you how to do that. But just pay close attention. And then don't be hesitant to go look up a commentary. There's so many good resources. Yeah, let me ask you about the commentary because, uh, you know, some people I read say that should be your last, do your own work Mm -hmm. first and Mm -hmm. then go get a commentary off the shelf. Uh, Agree or? I I actually do. When I have my students do exegetical work, I say start with listening because I I think as Hebrew says, the word of God is living and active. Um, The spirit will speak to individual believers, but you don't stop there. Mm -hmm. So get a sense of what, develop your own exegetical muscles and voice, and then you're going to have questions and then you need to go consult kind of the community of saints. Let me ask you, too, about this idea. And I think, to me, it's very new. Maybe it's been around longer than than I know. Um, I had uh, Dr. Dan Trier in here earlier, and and I know he's he's really interested in this idea that you mentioned of interpreting Scripture theologically Mm, and in the community of the church. Mm. I I did not hear that. I mean, I, I, I just did not hear that growing up at all. It was Bible means what it means. Okay. And, you know, so right. what do you mean by that? What yeah. does it mean to, to do theological interpretation mm. of the scripture? Yeah. yeah. You know, that question to me is a little bit funny because I think I come from the opposite end of the scale and that I've never heard it done any other way. Okay. <laughs> um, having been at a, a confessional school and then Princeton, well, may have a bad reputation for some, really, I studied under very faithful people and under some of the leaders of the biblical theology movement. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, that just means that I am informed by history, by narrative, by rhetoric, but that I don't stop there, that I ask that next set of questions. What does this reveal to me about God, the God who speaks in this text? And one very important way that I kind of try to take off my own lenses and glasses is by listening to the history of the church Mm -hmm. and how they've interpreted it. Now, they are one voice. They're not, um, they are a ministerial authority is one way to say, you know, they can be wrong, but they're someone we need to listen to. I think that's where maybe some people get fearful because yeah. we're taught and rightly that scripture is the inspired word of God. Exactly. And then as soon as you start saying these other, you know, how has the church looked at it? I think the fear is, well, are you saying there's more than one authority? Oh. You know, So I think that's why some people are a little skittish about right, that. Right. That makes sense. But really my, my feeling is I listen to others because I am fallible. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, now we're in postmodernism, maybe. I mean, I'm not a philosopher, but everyone would say you can't look at the Bible and just it's totally clear because you have these lenses yeah. on Everybody of your brings own their own. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it's listening to others that helps me see, oh, goodness, I've always assumed this and that may not be right. So it's not at all that scripture um, is uh, on par with other things. It is the primary authority, but it's that all humans are fallible in their right. interpretation. Yeah. So wouldn't you want a big group of people to help mm-hmm. you? Mm-hmm. So it's been fascinating. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Amy. It's great to have you here. Let me mention uh, again Amy's book, and you have to take a deep breath before you say this. <laughs> it's a long title. You Are My Son, The Family of God in the Epistle to the Hebrews, right? right. And that's just out. That's right. And then you're at work on this uh, book on the the fatherhood yeah, of God. Yeah, right? I think it will be called uh, Father, Mother, and Son, um, uh, the image and of God in an era of post-feminism. Wow, great. Another long title and exactly. well worth a read, I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. Good to have you here. Dr. Amy Peeler is uh, Assistant Professor of New Testament at Wheaton College, and as always, we'll encourage you to go to wheaton.edu where you can find out more about uh, the Biblical and Theological Studies Department here at uh, Wheaton College. For Inside Wheaton, I'm Greg Wheatley.